Hey, it's Matt LaRose here with Firearms Policy Coalition bringing you another weekly update, just to make sure you guys have all of the latest information on everything affecting your right to keep and bear arms. So without more, let's get stuck into it. This week saw Mississippi drop HB 753, which is really interesting. It sets up an interstate, basically, coalition of Second Amendment sanctuaries and sets up, you know, relationships between them, how it would be run. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It also, though, uh, declares federal statutes unconstitutional and of no effect. Now, we've talked before about the concept of sanctuary laws, and I really believe in them. I think that by saying, federal government, your law is unconstitutional and I will have no part in it, which a state has the authority to do, can send a message and it can normalize conduct and that paves the way for legality. What you can't do is say, federal government, your law is of no effect and you can't come and enforce it. Uh, that violates the supremacy clause. Now, I'm all in favor of poking governments in the eye. What I wish that these people would do is something more like, look, set up one law that actually establishes a sanctuary network that assures your people we will not be enforcing these unconstitutional, immoral laws against you, our people. And then if you want to do the saber rattling, if you want to make the big statement, do it in a separate law. And that way, if it gets knocked down in the federal courts, your people still have the assurance that you know their local neighborhood cop isn't going to lock them in the cage for choosing to exercise their right to control their own bodily autonomy by having a firearm. Like I was saying, cool concept, but I, I wish these states would just hold themselves accountable and send that message to their own people first before making a big show. Also, in Wyoming and Iowa, lawmakers are considering bills that would uh, restrict or eliminate gun-free zones. They're noticing that mass shootings and catastrophes, bombings, whatever, tend to happen in the soft targets, the gun-free zones. And so they're thinking perhaps we just get rid of that treatment. Uh, I think it makes sense. If there's no you know, legal guarantee that no one will be carrying, the soft target kind of goes away. Who knows where this will go, but you know, progress is progress. We'll keep our eyes on it. Now you've probably heard a thousand times people talking about, well, the founders could have never imagined this or that. And I generally answer, yeah, they could have never imagined the internet either, but I think they still meant it when they wrote the First Amendment. Uh, that said, people are often fixated on a 10 round magazine limit or what have you. And the Supreme Court says that weapons that are in common lawful use are presumptively constitutionally protected. So how far back do repeating firearms with 10 round plus magazines go? Well, in a brief written by FPC's own Joseph Greenlee and attorney David Kopel, uh, this has been explored. It actually goes back way further than you think. Uh, you can find a link to the brief in the write-up for this. As always, you can go to firearmspolicy.org, click on news, check on the link there, or we'll have a link to in the description. But it could go back centuries in common lawful use. So anyway, check that out. It's a great read, very well written. Now, Chuck Schumer wants to expand the scope of the federal government's definition of firearm. Right now, of course, America's a little unique in that we are specifically only regulate the receiver as a firearm. Uh, Chuck Schumer would want this to expand to more gun parts. Uh, of course, this is him vilifying our friends, the ghost guns, right? This, that, and the other thing. But it, it wouldn't do anything. As we've seen with creations like the FGC-9, a firearm that's primarily 3D printable, that uses no, nothing that you'd really consider an off-the-shelf gun part, this doesn't matter. It would have no effect on black markets. And just like we've seen, prohibition really didn't do much to stop the trade of alcohol, drugs, or whatever you can imagine. Just more stupidness. People think that they're being innovative. In reality, it's more of the same. Now, interestingly, two teachers groups in every town have gotten together to speak out against active shooter drills. Uh, they're saying that these drills are emotionally traumatizing, not effective, and they uh, distract from schoolwork. And I agree. Uh, probably not for all the same reasons these people think so, but I think they're a bad idea. School is supposed to be a place of learning. Uh, while I think the government has a duty to protect uh, students in schools, especially when they restrict your rights so heavily in there, these shooter drills, they remind me of uh, the Cold War duck and cover drills, where in case of an atomic bombing, you were to get under your desk and put your hands over your head. What could that do except cause fear? Some of these drills, they're using simulated gunfire. This is to prepare students for an event that is really, thank God, incredibly rare. 
Uh, you can read more about just how rare mass shootings are. We've, we've written a policy brief on it. Check out firearmspolicy.org, click on the policy section, you'll find it there. But I think that we should be, should not be doing this just because it's so rare. What's the point in causing kids? It's shown by some studies that this causes kids to lose sleep and lose focus in class. Very rarely, I'm with these people, uh, but for a different set of reasons, probably. Now, Elizabeth Warren has been busy this week. She's first talked about how she has a desire to increase tax on firearm sales and ammunition, which in her mind, and in the mind of actually several state lawmakers, a lot of people push this kind of garbage, would somehow fight crime. Now, if you are a person who is intent on doing something that might get you sent to jail for the rest of your life, I don't think you'll think that much more about spending a little bit of extra money on ammo, or you'll ignore it completely and just go through the black market. That said, if you're a law-abiding normal gun owner and the price of ammo doubles or you know goes up by a significant amount, what's likely to happen? You're likely to train less. You're likely to become less safe of a gun owner because you spend less time handling and learning about firearms. This also discourages people who are disadvantaged. Mind you, statistically, the people that are most likely to be violently victimized, it basically tells them, hey, sorry, guns are only for rich people. That's not right. And I don't understand how these politicians who claim to be progressive, uh, claim to be so concerned about the poor, are pushing policies that would, f on their face, only have an impact on the poor, on the people that need a effective mechanism of self-defense the most. I think that these price distortion laws, these tax increases or whatever, I think that they are the most despicable form of gun control, short of outright banning. Not only that, Warren promises that if elected president, she would eliminate the filibuster rule so that she could push gun control through the Senate. I mean, if I were president, I'd do some stuff I want to do. I'd uh, fix the sporting purposes test so we could bring in some good AK-74s, semi-autos, and whatever for people. I'd direct the ATF to chill and basically just stop it. I'd, I mean, I do a lot. But a lot like Warren, I'm not gonna be president. So what we wanna do and a quarter might get you a gun ball. And a follow up, if you remember back in the Virginia gun rights rally, we wanted to be able to say nobody got arrested, but there was a woman who was wearing a face mask in the freezing cold and you know, the Virginia police, they were there to protect and serve and hit her with a felony uh, face covering charge. Completely ridiculous. Finally this week, prosecutors dropped the charge. So that's, I'm glad that she can finally move on with her life a little bit more. But you know, this is really unjust. When you've been fed to the horrifying and expensive machine that is our criminal justice system, you have effects for the rest of your life. There are gonna be long lasting psychological effects, as well as changing the answer to you know, employment questionnaires, which probably shouldn't be asking this in the beginning, but ask, you know, have you ever been arrested regardless of the outcome? And for what? She was wearing a face covering, just like the pictures of cops who that day were wearing the same covering and tens of other people who were wearing, again, just keeping their faces protected from the chilling cold. It's better than nothing, but I still very much feel for that young woman. Oh boy, little Mike. Mike Bloomberg, despite being nowhere in the polls, can't stay out of the spotlight lately. Uh, audio from a speech that he gave a long time ago uh, where he bragged about New York City's stop and frisk policy a policy that caused generally minorities to experience targeted constant harassment on the streets of New York uh, has come back up. And of course, naturally, what are they looking for when they stop you and frisk you? They're looking to see if you've chosen to take your own bodily security into your own hands, if you've chosen to exercise your fundamental natural right to carry a firearm. And of course, people are coming to the defense of this policy, it's, it's really weird. Look, if, if you don't have reasonable suspicion, articulable suspicion, I don't mean the reasonable suspicion that, that uh, you know, courts recognize. I mean, if there's not an actual reason to assume that somebody is committing a crime, you should just leave them alone, all right? There's nothing to be gained by this.
any types of little wins, it, it's all nonsense. Anyone who's defending stop and frisk as a policy, I urge you to really think about how much you value the Constitution, how much you value your liberty. Well, that's it for this week. As always, you can find the full write-up of everything we covered here and more, some stuff we didn't get to talk about in the video, on firearmspolicy.org. Click on the news section, you'll see it there. You can also find a link, most likely, in the description. Um, also, these are posted on T-Tag every week. We just try our best to get this information out to you. As always, keep your eyes posted on firearmspolicy.org, where we're fighting for all of your rights all the time. I've been Matt LaRosier, and I'll see you real soon.